so I don't want this to be something that causes contention. This is me taking information and letting you make the assumption you want and the opinions you have. I don't plan to change your opinions in this video, I plan to open up your eyes to different opinions and kind of why people have these opinions um, and why someone, some people do what they do and try to bring awareness to something like the injection site that's opening. Like I said, I, it's, I'm not coming to you as a nurse, I'm not coming to you as university lepers, and I'm not coming to you as arches. I'm come, and I'm not expressing my opinion, I'm expressing a bunch of different opinions. <clears throat> some of them are probably, some of them will probably be similar to yours, and some of them will be completely the opposite. But like I said, this isn't me being opinionated, this is me expressing different views from different people. Um, and then at the end of this, you can decide what views you want to take into account um, and what views you want to press forward with. Um, if you have any questions, I have no problem whatsoever answering them. Um, if you have an argument, I'd love to hear it. I'm probably not going to answer because I really like hearing different people's opinions. I don't like arguing it um, because I, I feel confident in the safe injector site that's going to be opening. Um, I feel confident that me as a future nurse, um, or wherever life takes me, whether I want to do practitioner, whether I want to be a physician, um, I plan on helping uh, the at-risk population. And this isn't just drug abusers, this is, this is transgender, this is gay, lesbian, this is the whole LGBTQ plus community. Um, this is adolescents with mental health problems, uh, including depression, suicide tendencies, schizophrenia. I want to help all of these at-risk populations, and I plan to take that into my practice no matter where I go. Um, so we'll start off. Um, I wrote a bunch of notes while I was there. Um, I forgot my book on one of the most important days, so I just have a bunch of stinky notes that I took notes on. Um, you'll probably see me pause once in a while because <coughs> I have a pretty good cough, um, and that's why it took so long for me to do this video um, is because of that <coughs> cough. So if I pause, I'm just coughing up my left lung, and I'll come back, and then I'll probably pause again and cough up my right lung. Um, so hopefully I'll live through this video. Okay, <laughs> um, so let's... Um... <clears throat> so somehow I lost all of my video footage from last night. <laughs> so um, let's try this again. <coughs> Still got the cough. That didn't go away overnight. <coughs> so most of the questions that I was asked um, pertain to the opioid uh, crisis that is going on. Um, I don't know where I put my sheets. There we go. Um, and like the three crises that uh, a lot of us know about um, are prescription drugs um, that sometimes lead to the adulteration of fentanyl. Uh, and other opioids. So one of the first questions that I was asked is a common question is is marijuana a gateway drug? This isn't something we necessarily talked about in this conference but it's a great question and so because I had two or three people ask that same question I'm going to go ahead and answer it to the best of my ability. <clears throat> Throughout my time as a nurse at the conference um, and volunteer work, I have never come into a co contact with an opioid user or someone that abuses crack, cocaine, methamphetamine that doesn't smoke marijuana. Does that mean that marijuana leads to that? No, I don't think that every marijuana user is going to end up injecting heroin. Um, but I think that um, that probably doesn't help. I think that the way neurotransmitters work in your brain uh, with dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, 
you do crave that high and eventually marijuana doesn't fix that high and so you do want more but that I've also met a lot of users that abuse alcohol so is alcohol a gateway it just depends who you talk to again I don't think that every um, marijuana user is going to turn into a heroin addict um, but that's that's my two bits on that I don't think that it's necessarily a gateway drug but I've never met someone that abuses drugs that didn't start with marijuana. So it can be. I think that if someone smokes a lot of marijuana, could crave more of a high, and it could lead to addictions like that. Um, so that's my two bits on that. So back to Vancouver. Um, it was a great conference. I had the wonderful opportunity of having a travel buddy that we went from Lethbridge to Calgary, flew out of Calgary to Vancouver, stayed in the same hotel, and just kind of stuck together the whole time. Um, and he went with me on behalf of the FNMI community. So we had a lot of discussions about that. So I'm not going to touch particularly on the FNMI community. Um, for those of you that don't know what FNMI is, uh, First Nation, Métis, uh, Indigenous, Indigenous communities. Um, which uh, around this part is is a huge part of our population. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that, just because I would love to get Malcolm, who is my travel friend. I would love to get him. If you guys really like this video and you want to hear more on that, I would love to get him to come and talk to about it. I don't think that it's my place to say, even though we had a lot of conversations about it. I think it would be a, a little bit better to have my point of view and a First Nations point of view. And because there, whether we admit to it or not, there is an invisible barrier that is growing between these two communities. Um, and there is drug abuse happening on both of these communities. Um, there is a lot of drug abuse happening on the reserve, and there's a lot of drug abuse happening off the reserve. Um, so we did actually talk quite a bit about bridging the gap. Uh, there wasn't a lot of necessarily Métis and First Nation people in Vancouver, so they talked a little bit more about different culturals, um, but it definitely related back. Um, so yeah, went to this conference, um, and the way it was set up is you show up, you have opening ceremonies, and then you choose what you're interested in, and then you go to different conference halls and discuss these issues. So. Me, I chose, my first one was uh, the opioid crisis. Second one was transgender and the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus community. Um, and then my third one was sex trade workers. Um, quite a big turnout for most of them. Not much for the transgender one, which I think shows that it is a little bit of a problem. Um, <coughs> so it shows that it is a problem uh, so I'll get to that but I think that mostly people are interested in the uh, what I have to say about the opioid uh, and fentanyl problem so I'm going to start with that um, so I found myself sitting in um, in this meeting uh, sitting in a $400 a night hotel Eating fresh as caught salmon in the morning. <laughs> um, the whole caviar lifestyle. Showing up to a conference that you can't get into unless you're dressed to the nine. Um, so we were all, you know, first day I was wearing a suit. Second day I was uh, business casual. But this opened up my eyes because we sat here in, again, this expensive hotel, which, don't get me wrong, I didn't, I'm a student, I did not pay $400 a night for this hotel. I didn't have to pay for part of it, but um, I think the Pinnacle and uh, University of Lethbridge was 
and all of the sponsorships were kind enough to uh, help us out with that, um, to let us stay in the same hotel that our conference was in. But again, uh, I, I say those prices because we're sitting in all of that, spending all of this money, talking about a population that's five blocks that way. And so this kind of hit me. It hit me that uh, spending all this money here, drinking cappuccinos and eating freshly caught salmon, talking about the homeless population that's not like a ways away, is five blocks that way and three blocks that way. Uh, this uh, part of Vancouver is called East Hastings. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's arguably the uh, the capital of drug use in Canada. I say that arguably because there's a lot of statistics that is showing that it is growing all the way across Canada. But uh, so the only point of that was is that we were, you know, we were sitting in this expensive place, five blocks that was these tastings. So um, the next part of uh, the nursing um, this conference was student presentations. It's not that these aren't important, they were important. Um, they're basically just on kind of research articles and how to do research and how to properly post a research article. Uh, something I'm not as much interested in. I feel like I've spent four years writing research papers. Fuck, I can miss that. So, excuse me. Um, I started talking to a few of my friends there and I was like, hey, like, why are we, you know, and I brought that up to him, like, why are we sitting here in suits and ties talking about a population that's five blocks that way? We're not talking about it from across Canada. We're actually here. Let's go see it. And there was two or three people that were just like, yeah, why not? So we went upstairs, um, took off our suits and dresses and um, decided to go down there. So I put a hat on, put my rain jacket on, um, and went out on a endeavor <laughs> to head over there and see um, how Insight is ran and such. Uh, Insight is the safe injection site that's happening uh, in Vancouver in East Hastings. Um, so yeah, we started heading down there. I found out about two blocks in that the jacket that I thought was rain proof, it wasn't. It just absorbed it and I was freezing. Uh, but kept on my way probably why I have this cough <laughs> um, so yeah we headed down there and we got to speak with some of the population down there I didn't take any pictures while I was down there because I don't think that it is uh, I don't think it's a tour guide I went down there for figuring out how I can come back and help so I did take some pictures, however, of some of the artwork that was down there. There was one piece of artwork, and um, I'll post it uh, probably on my page. And it said fentanyl overdoses in the, in, uh, the middle of dope, uh, and middle city of dope is East Hastings. Um, seven, or 656, and then it has it scratched out, and it's like, um, now it's 752. That's two overdose deaths a day that's happening in East Hastings. This is just a few blocks radius. Tell me it's not a problem. Um, I found out when I went to Insight that um, Insight is not, it depends what you perceive as effectiveness. If you're saying that the safe injection site is giving someone off drugs. It might not be as effective as we'd like. If you're asking effectiveness of overdoses, it is a hundred percent effective. Not sixty, not seventy, not eighty, a hundred percent effective. Since Insight, the safe injection site has put into play in these tastings, they have not had one overdose death. That to me is amazing. And I really hope that with Leftbridge gaining the safe injection site, that we will be able to 
live up to that, that we will be able to have that 100% effective rate. So yeah, it, um, it was amazing to see on um, first hand go down there uh, and see there's, there's more tourniquets than there is sidewalks. Um, it's not hidden there. People are doing it in broad daylight. You're seeing people smoke, crack, you see crack pipes, meth pipes, people shooting needles. Not hidden at all. Um, when I walked by Insight, I recognized that there was a lot of people that were doing drugs outside of Insight. And that was because it was full. And these individuals felt like, hey, at least if I'm outside of this, I can get help. So, to me, it's, it's amazing that it's been 100% effective there. And um, I think that with it coming to Lethbridge, it might not be the cure that everyone's looking for. But if we can save someone's cousin, mom, dad, friend, son, daughter, if we can save one person that can hopefully lead and I'm not saying that every person you save the next day they're going to turn a new leaf and be like, I'm going to go to rehab, I'm going to get help. But if we can save one person that leads to that, that goes to seek help, I think we've done a, I think we've done a good deed. I think that it's, it's amazing. And I think that with one person being saved, a safe injection site will be useful. Uh, a lot of people are confused with the safe injection and consumption site. And I, I personally am not opening it, so I can't touch on a lot of the things. But the main thing I will touch on is a lot of people feel that we are providing drugs and such. That's not going to happen. It's just a safe place to do it. Another thing is that the building is going to be that safe injection, safe consumption site. But there's also going to be other areas for it. for help, that if someone comes in there and is like, you know what, this is, I don't want to do this anymore, I need help, there are people there that can push someone in the right direction of where they can get help. So again, it might not be the cure that everyone's looking for, but it's a start. It's a really good start. Um, second question that I had and uh, if you want to ask more questions on that first topic feel free to message me like I said I, I'm i totally open for questioning I can't answer them upon the University of Lethbridge or as a nurse or even my volunteer work with Arches that I'm not coming on behalf of any of them this is strictly what I've seen as an innocent bystander and that's why I'm trying not to touch on anything that I've found through nursing or found through volunteer work through Arches this is things that I've come into contact with in my Vancouver uh, endeavor, and also things I've con come into contact with every day. Um, a lot of people don't think that it is a huge problem in Lethbridge, and this is something that I um, came across through speaking with uh, the homeless population even in Lethbridge, is that I know on a Saturday alone, uh, a couple months ago, we had eight overdoses that happened just alone on a Saturday uh, at the homeless shelter. That's mind-blowing, because that's just on a Saturday alone. I found out later how many of them lived, but that, again, was through my work as a nurse, so I can't really touch on that, but it's, it's eye-opening. And Vancouver was a humbling experience. It really was. So, yes. The second question I was asked was someone brought up Portugal. For those of you that don't know what's happening in Portugal, it was in 2001, Portugal legalized, no, sorry, decriminalized all drug use. Whether it's heroin, methamphetamine, crack, cocaine, marijuana, it's all decriminalized. And... With that, 
They only have three overdoses per million people. So a lot of people bring that up because they're like, hey, like, what if we did that? But every person that's ever asked me that question always says, hey, like, why don't we legalize it? That's where the, that's where the confusion comes into play. There's a difference between legalizing and decriminalizing. And I think that legalizing scares a lot of people. Because legalizing means that I could go to the nearest fast gas, grab a Snickers bar, grab Doritos, go up to the front counter and say, yeah, I'd like some uh, Canadian Club cigarettes and uh, heroin. And the guy would be like, okay, what kind? Uh, do you have black tar? And he's like, oh yeah, we got, we got tons of black tar. We got a few different kinds. And then you could just take it and just shoot, shoot up wherever. That is a scary thought. So I get where people are like, can not legalize it? Portugal decriminalized it. Which means that if they catch someone that has marijuana or crack, cocaine, heroin, they're not going to, they're not going to arrest them. That being said, if someone had a truckload of heroin, they're not just going to be like, ah, oh, just pass on through. They're trying to stop the, tr um, the movement of drugs. They're trying to stop the creation and the selling of drugs. So that's where people get confused. So it's actually a great question. Um, so I had asked this individual that came to them thus. He was uh, the head of organized crime and was a drug expert in multiple court cases. Uh, his name is Bill Spearn. Um, and yeah, he plays a huge role in, uh, in Vancouver and in particular the East Side, which East Hastings. So there's really no one better to speak to about this problem. And I had the opportunity to speak with him about it. Um, he also was a main advocate for why the Vancouver Police Department now carries in the lock zone. And for those of you that don't know what the lock zone is, it's in easier terms is a reversal for opiate. So if someone goes into an opiate crisis, uh, overdoses on fentanyl, uh, naloxone can reverse it. So he was the he was the main advocate that made it so that Vancouver Police Department could carry naloxone. And that is spread across Canada. I know Lethbridge Police now does, and I know Calgary Police carries the nasal spray. Um, so yeah, he's he's been completely invested in it and that's that's great um so i asked him i kind of noted about the portugal thing um asked if you think it would make a difference and he said something interesting he said that he doesn't feel it would make a difference because in his eyes it already is decriminalized and said that right now all of his officers do not arrest someone for just doing the for just finding uh, drugs on them. So he feels that it would not make a difference because in his eyes it's already decriminalized, maybe not in the law, but that he's not trying to arrest the average person that's just has drugs on them. He's trying to catch kind of like Portugal, the trade of it, the selling of it, and the distribution. I saw this firsthand when I went down to East Hastings. Uh, there was an individual that I talked to about how about how they feel things are being run. And while I was talking to him, um, he started to um, engage in drug use. And whilst me standing there, I see a Vancouver police walking down the street towards us and I'm like kind of what is my role here do I tell them so I'm like uh, just so you know um, there's a police officer he's like oh don't worry about it 
Okay, so I kind of take a few steps back because I'm a long way from home. I don't want to get arrested. So, as this police officer walks by, he says hi. And the guy says hi back. He just keeps going. Like this, he literally is boiling drugs. And the officer just says hi. So I was amazed there, right? I'm like, okay, like, um, he's right. It is basically decriminalized. Uh, but then once I actually asked quite a few individuals down there, because it's not a law for, I guess, the opposite, because it is still a law, it depends on the officer. There's a lot of officers that work down in these stations that are not looking to do that. But there's a lot of officers that still do arrest because they have the right to, because it, it is still against the law. So once you talk to more people, they don't feel like uh, the decriminalization is there. So there's a, there's a variance of stories there. There's a variance of what I'm being told and what I'm seeing. So I don't have a straightforward answer for the Portugal question, um, except that it's really worked well for Portugal. I'm not sure how it would work here, and I'm not sure if it would change anything. So it, it'll be interesting to see uh, if that ever happens, which is a lot that'll happen before that'll happen. Portugal is also treating this as a public health problem. To me, that's correct. I think that right now it is causing a problem in the healthcare system that it is a public health problem. But once it's being sold and distributed, it's a criminal problem that's out of public health hands. But as for the injection, the drug use, it is a public health problem and it is, it is a health services problem to be dealt with. So that's, that's my two bits on Portugal. Um, and I hope that we all kind of gained a little bit of insight about what's going on there. Again, um, I really hope that one day my passion for this can be in more of a professional manner right now I'm just the everything aside I'm just having a passion for it and speaking on it uh, I'm not speaking upon any organization and I hope that one day I will be able to speak on behalf of an organization like Arches um, and deal with this in a more professional manner that I won't be talking on YouTube I will be hopefully spreading it and when the safe injection site opens, I I plan to try to get a job there. Because my passion is for the sat risk population, and that's not just the homeless population, that's not just the drug abusers, this is the LGBTQ community, this is adolescents with mental health problems, whether it be depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, this interests me, and I think that a lot a lot of these individuals and in at-risk population get looked over. And so I hope that I will be able to pursue my love for this topic and my passion for this topic and that I will be able to have a professional say in what's going on and be able to spread what I'm talking about now but um, in different atmospheres. The next, the next question is something that's gonna hit a little bit, I think a lot of us a little closer to home, uh, especially people from Lethbridge. Um, one of the questions I always have about the safe injection site is how this is gonna be great for, and I talk about the homeless population a lot, and that's just because we talked about it a lot there. And with the safe injection site and consumption site opening up, um, only just across the bridge from the homeless shelter, just a few blocks, It'll be, I do feel like it'll be majority of a homeless population that uh, takes part in this. Um, but it is not just the homeless population that is dealing with this problem. Um, you see in the news and you hear about uh, even businessmen that overdose in their million dollar home. Uh, you hear of younger populations that overdose. Um, so this is kind of what gave my passion in this. Uh, people like, I'm not just saying this here, 
uh, BR, MP, HB. Uh, these are just three of many younger populations that have lost their life to overdose. How do we help them? I don't, I didn't personally know, I knew one of these individuals very well, but I don't personally know the other two, so I can't speak on behalf of them to know if they would take part in safe injection, but I know that this individual that I do know, he would not have gone down every day to a safe injection site. And that's not necessarily due to pride, it's not necessarily due to embarrassment. It's, I think, that whether it's a one-time use or an addiction, and I'm not saying that any of these individuals had addictions or if they were a one-time use, I don't know. All I know is they're, they're not the only three people that have dealt with this. I'm sure a lot of us do know individuals, and I know quite a few individuals that uh, still take part in drug use. But how do we help them? How do we make this? How do we make something like Safe Injection Site more open for them? Because it is open. Anyone can come. But would a younger population like that? come into a safe injection site when that's usually something that's hidden and that to me is the next step I think that we're on a great track with the safe injection site opening up but the next step is how do we help people like BR, MP HB how do we help people like them because unfortunately they're gone But there's a lot of people still struggling that aren't gone. So how do we help them? I think that's the next step. And I really hope we can move more towards it. But if anyone watches this video that is struggling, it is open to anyone. Whether you have problems with consumption injection it is open for you to go to and it is completely confidential confidential so we don't need to know your name where you live it is a safe spot for it I know in Vancouver uh, we can test the drugs for uh, fentanyl it doesn't tell us if it's what type of fentanyl it is but we can definitely test drugs and unfortunately there's not many drugs coming through right now that don't have fentanyl in it whether it be heroin, marijuana, crack, cocaine, we're finding fentanyl on everything. But we can test it. In Vancouver, I, th I can't speak upon the one that's opening up in Lethbridge, but I'm, pr I'm quite confident that if we can't read at the start, that that's something that's the next step. Another thing with opioid abuse is I believe that there's a, it's not necessarily what I believe, but um, from what I've seen, a lot of drug abuse is a concurrent disorder. And that's something that I feel strongly about. For those of you that don't know what concurrent is, it just means that there's two causes. So my passion is actually trying to continue to do research and prove that there is two causes to this. It's not just the drug abuse, there's something behind it. And from my experience, I have found that drug abusers do have a history of depression, anxiety, even schizophrenia, uh, and drug-induced um, mental health issues. I had the opportunity of working uh, as a for my clinical um, out in Claire's home. And in Claire's home, I got to choose to be on the concurrent addictions unit. So, first part of it engages in the actual addiction. Second part of it engages strictly in whatever the concurrent problem is. So that's something I feel passionate about. I think that this is happening a lot with the younger population. That drug abuse has come from somewhere. And a lot of, some people don't agree with me on that topic. And that's okay. And I'm going to go through this without stating my opinion. 
but that is one thing that I feel strongly about and that I will place my opinion in. I think that drug abuse does come from a concurrent problem. Um, and that's why my passion is not only for mental health, but it is uh, drug abuse. Um, so that is... That's my opioid uh, rant of sorts. Um, and I hope that if anyone does have questions, again, I know I've said this a few times, but feel free to ask. If you have an opinion, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm not really an arguable, I don't really argue very often because I like to hear different points of view. I like to take in every point of view and see where my mind leads me. Um, and I hope that even if just one person that's listened to this has got something out of it is that at least Maybe they don't change their opinion on it, but at least their mind opens up to different opinions on it and see from different sides. So that's that's my opioid discussion. Uh, I'm going to next talk about uh, the transgender portion of it and the LGBTQ plus community, and then I'll talk a little bit about sex chain workers. Um, so if you keep listening, um, I have some good information on that too, but if this is the only thing you're interested in, then thank you for watching. <coughs> All right. So, transgender, uh, LGBTQ community. Um, <coughs> there wasn't many people that is, that uh, came to this portion of the conference, and that to me shows that there is there is an issue with this. There is not a lot of people that are taking interest in it when it is a growing population. Um, most of this discussion wasn't necessarily about healthcare in this. It's more about trying to open up our minds to uh, the different references and the different... Um, but the point of this discussion is I... The main thing I wanted to say is that I feel like a lot of us get caught up in saying that um, we live in a Bible Belt or that we're not open enough and that we're not accepting enough. But I think that we all need to take a step back and see the growth that's happening. We have... People like Levi Cox and Graham Black that are changing the face of the LGBTQ plus community. And that's happening right here in Lethbridge, and I think that's great. Um, the Galt Gardens is now having, not just for one week, having the rainbow uh, sidewalk. We're trying to keep that. I know that there has been vandalism to that, and that's heartbreaking. As someone that is straight, but does have a passion for this topic, that is absolutely heartbreaking that some of that happens. But I think we also need to take a moment and look at the good. That although we might not, we might know a lot of people that aren't accepting, we have grown so much with someone like Levi Cox being in place, changing the face of the LGBTQ plus community, and that's right here in Lethbridge, and that's, that's amazing. All right, last topic, we're gonna to talk about a sex trade. Um, it's gonna be quick and brief. Um, because I don't, there definitely is a, there definitely is prostitution that happens in Lethbridge, and I'm sure there's stuff that happens in rural areas. Um, it's not something I'm going to hide behind and be like, oh yeah, it's not a problem. Here it is. It is a problem. And it, define, it depends what you classify as sex trade. Uh, do you classify pornography as sex trade? Do you, when you think of sex trade, uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is prostitution. So I'm not going to get into a pornography discussion in this in this video, but if you ever ask me uh, face to face, I I definitely could get put up a discussion of um, my opinion on pornography. So sex trade, prostitution. So I think that a lot of our minds are wrapped around how there's a lot of with sex trade, I think a lot of the things that get talked about is that there is quite a bit of abuse that usually happens. Um, do we put this abuse with sex trade or do we put it because it's illegal? I have come into a contact with uh, individuals and that have engaged in sex trade and 
as much as a lot of us might talk, take it as a job, sometimes it's treated as a job, and I think that the reason that a lot of people don't think of it as a job is because it is illegal, and it is happening behind closed doors. Um, if it was open, legal, and there was, and it was a business, would we call it a business? A lot of the time, I even find that if I come in contact with this, my even my initial reaction is when they say that uh, they engage, that their profession is sex trade, and I have come in contact with this. Uh, my initial reaction is like, oh, like how do we help them get out? Some people want to be in there. Some people, that's their job, and they want it to be treated as a job. So I got to keep my open mind and treat it as a job. But most of the abuse that I have seen and most of the abuse that I have researched happens because it's in a back alley, it's in an unsafe environment, um, because it's, they're trying to hide it. Would that abuse still happen if it was legalized? If there was a, <coughs> if there was a safe place to go and engage in it? Uh, I think we all uh, correlate um, drug abuse with sex trade. I think that that does get confused sometimes uh, when we think that people are engaging in sex trade to pay for a drug addiction. In some, in some scenarios, that may be true, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm just going to talk about is mostly just that there is a lot of abuse that happens in sex trade. There, You do hear a lot of stories about uh, deaths, abuse. Would it, would that cease if we had a safe environment for people to engage in this in? Again, I don't want to state my opinion because um, this is just supposed to open up minds to it. It, uh, there's a potential for it because from what I've seen, anyone that has, a, has been in a bad situation or is beaten up, it's never in a safe environment. It's because uh, these individuals feel like they have to do it uh, in a back alley and it's not safe. Uh, most people don't have, um, a lot of people are referred to as a pimp agency, doesn't matter. A lot of people don't have that behind them, but they just do it on the streets. So, would, would the abuse cease if there's a safe environment? I think that it's, there, it's a long ways from this being a law and legalizing it. I think that we're taking it one step at a time, but that's that's what I learned from there. Again, I think that a big topic for all of these are, uh, especially in this area, I think are uh, talking about the invisible barrier that's happening between not only homeless people, uh, but First Nations and um, on and off reserve. Again, I'm, I'm not really going to speak upon it as much as I do feel like I do have lots of knowledge upon it and I do have an interest in it. I think that it would be better if you guys are still interested that I get Malcolm to come and we kind of speak upon that because Malcolm, Malcolm is very, he's a very cultural based individual. Um, we had a really good time uh, at Vancouver. We got into some very in-depth conversations and I would rather speak about these conversations with him. Um, so if you've watched all the way to the end of it, um, I appreciate it. Tell me what you think. I hope that I could even open up your mind to even just one, one different thought. So, yeah. Um, thank you.